Restoration must be part of the solution for protecting our reefs, yet we've not been able to demonstrate its success at great scale. At Iberostar, we're working on standardizing restoration programs across multiple locations in the Caribbean so we can best understand how tourism can catalyze solutions. Let's explore some examples of cross-sectorial collaboration, some of the largest and oldest restoration operations in the world, and some out-of-the-box ideas for solutions for scaling. My name is Dr. Megan Morikawa, and I'm the Global Director for Sustainability at Iberostar Group. And I'm thrilled to have a great set of panelists today to have a conversation about scaling reef restoration. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Rebecca Albright, Assistant Curator of Invertebrate Zoology at the California Academy of Sciences. Ken Niedemeyer, founder of the Coral Restoration Foundation and Reef Renewal International Program. We have Dr. Sergio Rossi, Professor at the University of Salento, and our own Dr. Joanna Calle, Regional Science Coordinator for Wave of Change Movement at Iberostar. We're gonna jump right into our first question, which is to juxtapose the barriers and, and need for standardizations and scale that we've been talking about in some of our other Riding the Wave series and jump straight into solutions. So Ken, I'm wondering, can you tell us a little bit on what some of the solutions are that you're suggesting and or implementing in, in the organizations that you've worked with and are working with? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, one of the first things that I've learned is um, you need to find local owners, people that, that really want to do this. If you go into a program and you start it as a grant, just grant driven, and you don't have a local owner, you know, somebody there that really wants to do it, then as soon as the grant money dries up, the program dies. And so we look for, for what I call local owners or local ownership, trying to develop that concept. And along with local ownership comes local support. Then you have to develop a standardized system that can be duplicated and, and replicated throughout different areas. And that's what we've been working on. A lot of what we've been doing too has been in the tourism sector and depending on, you know, tourism to help support the work. And I think there's a lot of ways to engage tourists, um, tourism money to get the work done, not just the money, but the people themselves. And if you can get a tourist out there planting a coral, he's going to be an owner. So, I mean, one of the things we started early on at the Coral Restoration Foundation and now at Reef Renewal is we have developed uh, recreational dive programs where uh, people can actually take a class and then we take them out to a nursery and they work there and then they we harvest corals and go plant them on the reef. So this is usually a one or two day program and they take that story back to their home and they put it on social media and all of a sudden they're doing the, the talking for you. So it's great. As part of our Hope for Reefs initiative, we have one of the things that we're really focusing on to address scalability is integrating um, tech solutions. So trying to partner with um, private sector, which and and some of the tech companies in the Bay Area to try to come up with solutions that might address getting more corals out onto the reef um, faster. So a couple of the projects that we have, um, one is in partnership with Autodesk and the Nature Conservancy and Seacor. We have a partnership with those four organizations to try to um, 3D print and create substrates that are self-stabilizing. And we've come up with a bunch of different prototypes of this through collaborations with Autodesk. And that would actually remove the human labor component of having to actually go and epoxy or cement an individual coral onto the reef. And that's one of the bottlenecks um, to scalability. Another really interesting project that we have going on to address scalability is um, a project we were supporting over the last year with a researcher named Dr. Taryn Foster from Australia, who was with us on a Fulbright scholarship. And she was also working with Autodesk and Cal Academy to introduce robotics and automation into um, reef restoration. And, and the idea there is to 3D print a coral skeleton and try to give it the, the actual framework from the get-go so it doesn't have to spend 10 years building the skeleton. In this very moment, we do need to change completely our minds. And from my point of view, uh, look at the restoration as a real possibility to not only restore coral reefs or restore uh, um, 
a really fantastic and biodiverse uh, 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 habitat, but especially, especially to try to get as much as we can an habitat that can help us to cope with, for example, climate change mitigation, uh, fisheries, and so on and so on. So it has to be at a large scale. So I think it's, we have bottlenecks, but on the other side, we do have enough, from my point of view, we do have enough tools now to just, just pass this obstacle and make large scale restoration. One of the things that we're doing at Iberostar is to think a little bit in, in between these two great examples, which on one side is, is how we can apply automation and technology to be able to help scale this practice. And then another is thinking about this industrialization and just kind of increasing scale, whether that be through number of hands or thinking about uh, uh, core restoration as as some sort of, of, of thing that you can have as part of an operation, right? And I think this is one of the areas that um, we're hoping to think a little bit outside of the box and how can actually a tourism industry that does a lot of maintenance on their own facilities extend that just to couple of meters out to the reef, but bring in the skills and expertise to be guided and the technology that's also coming out to help us uh, do that in a way that helps us to scale. Um, Joanna, maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of the solutions that which we're, we're hoping to work towards with Iberostar, but also in general that you feel are totally unexplored. What are some lacking, what are we lacking in innovation or collaboration from other sectors? Thank you, Megan. In my opinion, particularly in the Caribbean, uh, we, have, uh, we have few results from large scale reef restoration programs. So finding solutions to help coral reefs become more resilient in this changing environment is a challenge. <laughs> in addition, most uh, restoration efforts currently focus on a limited number of species, which do not accurately uh, represent reef biodiversity. So I think a collaboration with um, other sectors could be more effective and we should try to align the environmental policies of governments with communities and private sector to maintain sustainable practices. This is something perfectly in tune with uh, what what Iberostar recently launched its, its vision, vision for restoration for the tourism sector, which is if we align ourselves with some of these goals and focus on coastal protection, that rugosity in the reef and biodiversity to make sure that any of the operations that we take are prepared for climate change, that we can enhance the experience for our clients in the short term, perhaps through some of those experiences that Sergio was uh, was talking about, but also in the long term for the ecosystem services that we're looking for that do return in these settings. So I think that's a really great overview of, uh, you know, there there is some different steps you take in restoration, depending on what your goals are, but also recognition that this is a, an investment and long-term investment. Sergio, do you want to tell us a little bit on, on, on both that timing, but also whether you think it's possible to scale reef restoration in an economically viable way? So here you have to attract the people, uh, making sure that restoration is what could be important. We do have to make a very ambitious plan, and it's the moment to do that. But we have to un also understand that the times of these organisms are not very fast. Even if there is some acropora or some species of scleractinians that may grow faster, it's not immediate. And you have to make them understand that they are allies. They are really organisms that in the long term will help to in some way mitigate climate change, among many other things. I think this need to scale and uh, with a balance of both speed but also patience is a, an interesting tension that um, uh, I, I hope that the private sector could provide some insight to uh, more and more that we discover the ways in which tourism, which has presence in a lot of these locations for many, many, many years, could potentially help us with some of these longer term solutions. The more that I hope that private sector can help us to find that balance between the short term and the long term. 
Rebecca, you told us a little bit about some of the ways you at California Academy of Science are working with the tech industry and with engineering industry. Um, what other what are some other roles that the private sector could play in helping to scale these solutions? Are there other industries or or, or that that you think could also be playing or should be playing a larger role in in its restoration and protection? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think right now some of the most exciting stuff around reef restoration is some of this innovative thinking that that you know we may not be there yet, but I think kind of thinking at the crossroads and intersections of, of disciplines has the potential to be very powerful, um, and it has has been so in a lot of different um, challenges, uh, you know, over the last several decades and centuries. And so, um, any opportunities for the private sector to um, offer opportunities to engage to biologists and ecologists and learn and partner. So some of the the um, collaborations that I talked about before with Autodesk, we've had some really powerful um, pr collaborations with them through their residency program um, and through pro bono support through their teams. And so some corporations like Autodesk have residents that you apply as a biologist or an ecologist or whatever your discipline is. Um, and then you can, if you're accepted, you get, um, you're introduced into their residency program to learn a skill set that you may never have uh, experienced before and to apply that to your work. And there are additional, pro additional programs like pro bono support where you can apply to get anywhere from five to 10 experts from another discipline to consult and advise you on the development of your particular project or design or whatever it is that you're trying to tackle. And I think those types of um, pro bono residency fellowship programs to bring different disciplines together to try to tackle solutions from um, uh, an interdisciplinary standpoint are really, really powerful. We found this to be very much true at Barristar as well. We were tasked with constructing a, a coral lab facility that would help us to accelerate some of the work that we were doing in reef restoration, because as you say, sometimes you need some land-based efforts and some in-water efforts in order to, to make solutions scale. And all of a sudden within this facility, we had local expertise on, on, on plumbing and heating and cooling and maintaining these systems in, in, in other settings and the skill set not only just the finances, but the skill set of people in other industries immediately helped us to scale some of these solutions much faster. And that, along with the incredible capacity for a director of a dive operator or a director of a hotel to understand the logistics of scaling restoration much better than myself as a scientist might need to do, has really taught us a lot of lessons about how skill sets from other industries might be really aptly applied to some of the problems that we're still facing on scaling reef restoration. Joanna, do you want to tell us a little bit as well your perspective on what role some of uh, that the private sector could play in helping to scale some of these solutions? Yes, of course, Megan. Um, for me to know that a hotel company wanted to do science was such a pleasant surprise. <laughs> and I think that it would be great if more private sector companies try to promote good practices for ocean conservation. Rebecca, do you have any good tips on what an average citizen could do to also help support the scaling of reef restoration? Yeah, there's so much. I mean, I would say I, I could talk for a long time about this, but I'll say, um, you know, there are direct ways that you can get involved. A lot of um, reef restoration groups right now are kind of depending on citizen scientists or volunteers to actually help reduce some of those bottlenecks, like putting corals up, back out onto the reef. So you can actually, you know, if, if you're a diver, if you are marine minded, you can actually get directly involved with some of those outplant efforts. There are land-based things. You can do data entry. Most reef restoration um, groups are not necessarily very well funded. And so they, you know, citizen science and volunteer goes a long, long way. And so I would say reach out to them if you're interested and see how you can engage. And then otherwise, I would just say that Everything you do in your daily life, I mean, again, going back to this idea that in a perfect world, we don't need reef restoration. So anything that every, there's 7.6 billion of us on this planet, choosing sustainable sources of seafood, reducing your carbon footprint, living in a more sustainable way, voting, 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 um, all of those things to try to 
promote marine conservation, marine protection, reducing um, water quality issues, overfishing issues, all of these things that plague coral reefs, the more that you can promote those, whatever way you're comfortable doing is going to be very, very meaningful at scale. I think to, to get the average citizen involved, first of all, not every citizen is going to care about coral reefs. And I think you have to just understand that. But this, the average citizen that does care, that they have to be aware that something can be done. So that, that's real important because there's this universal message out there that it's doom and gloom and there's no hope for the coral reefs. And I disagree vigorously. So we have to educate them on, you know, show them what can be done, what is being done. But if, if they can get involved some, one way or another, start following some of these different organizations on social media and then donate. When you get private donations like that, it's kind of like gold because it allows you to um, innovate into new areas. If people can get involved in supporting um, the people out in the field doing the work, uh, that would really help. Thank you all for a really great discussion that we've had about some of the solutions for scaling reef restoration. I hope throughout the entire series of our riding the wave on rebuilding coral reefs, we've learned a little bit about the, the complexities, but the hopeful spots of defining targets for reef restoration, uh, highlighting some of the incredible work that is happening in the Latin American region and Caribbean basin, looking at ways we can prepare these efforts for changing climate Climate. And of course, today with our speakers on looking at uh, solutions for scale. So thanks so much to the panelists and we look forward to seeing you in our next Riding the Wave.